And let's move on to the the to this the uh, another <clears throat> very important topic uh, in the fish biology. That is the the reproduction, the dispersal, and migration. Right. So some of you will wonder why you, of course, you have heard about reproduction, and but what is this dispersal and migration? We might not familiar with. Some of you might not familiar with this thing, but very briefly we'll discuss these things. Uh, even the reproduction, I mean, there's a lot of things to learn about the reproduction. Um, the aquatic science students might have learned a lot on this aspect for the theology as well. So um, I just want to bring everyone into a common ground uh, with their knowledge, a little bit of knowledge on the biology. So that's why I very briefly quickly go through some of the very important aspects in their biology. So uh, if we start with the, the reproduction, but before coming into the reproduction, we have something called the life history strategies, like uh, the from the eggs to the larval stages to adult stages, like what kind of strategies do they have? So that's what we call the life history strategies. There are different life history patterns among fish. It's very different again, just like feeding, very different from one species to another as well as different groups have different um, life history strategies just to survive. So um, if you look at the, the, the reproduction, there are many different modes of reproduction. It's very complicated, that's why I'm not going to go into very detail here. But uh, even the, the spawning behavior, I mean, the way they produce eggs or larvae, we call the spawning, right? The, the production of eggs or the larval stages. There are different modes, like as I've seen here, the oviparous spawning behavior, where they lay eggs, uh, and they are fertilizing just outside or the externally. And after laying eggs, the mother has no any control over they, they don't have any um, uh, care for their young ones and they have to feed themselves. Right? At the early stage, they have to survive with the yolk and uh, then they have to find their own food. Right. So that is oviparous uh, uh, spawning behavior, which most of the fish have this kind of a oviparous feeding behavior. Right. So at the time, from the time of their birth, they are independent. They have to be independent. So that oviparous, then they, the second uh, spawning behavior called the ovoviparous, right? Um, in this case, the the female, they produce their eggs and they keep in internal in their body and they fertilize internally as well. But the difference is the, they, don't, uh, they don't provide the nutrition. Right? But of course, the, the yolk will have all the nutrients they want, but uh, the mother doesn't have to feed them um, directly. Right? So the third type is called the viviparous. They, they also internal fertilization, just like the oviparous, but the, the difference is they, the mother provide the, the nutrition for their babies, right? So, so these are the main uh, different form of spawning behavior. So this, uh, the oviparous, the oviparous, oviparous. Um, and if you look at the different fish, they have all different way of uh, uh, adaptation for these different reproductive uh, strategies, right? Uh, you might have seen this kind of fish, the mollies, and then especially the guppies. guppies, we call them as the live bearers uh, because the, they produce babies instead of eggs. Most of the fish they produce eggs. Uh, even the sharks, uh, they produce eggs. It's in the larvae, 
not the the eggs you won't you won't see sharks eggs because they are internally fertilized and then um, <clears throat> uh, what is coming out is the 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 young ones not the eggs right right um, <clears throat> and on the other hand the there is a difference in the like we call this reproductive episode like how many times do they reproduce during their lifetime and that's called the reproductive episodes like some fish for example this uh, the, the the salmon you know this uh, salmon fish right uh, they reproduce only once during their lifetime Right. They can uh, reproduce only one time and they die after reproduction. A right. single reproductive event we call in such reproductive episode or the strategy we call the semalparas. Right. And the, the other type of uh, reproductive behavior called the iteroparas. Uh, like iteration means uh, again and again. So they can reproduce several times during their lifetimes. Right. So uh, Samalparas versus uh, Iteraparas and even like there are so many differences in their mating systems like uh, some uh, some male will have single female partner right some have multiple partners likewise there are so many differences in uh, their reproductive uh, patterns as well, or the, their different mating systems. Again, you don't have to memorize anything. I'm just mentioning these things just to uh, uh, have an uh, overview on these things, uh, how different these are among different fish. Uh, but uh, of course, the biology. I mean, you are biologists already, you already know what is this polygamous and monogamous fish, like uh, uh, this kind of a reproductive behavior. But uh, if you don't know, just forget about that and, and you don't have to memorize these things. Uh, but it just basic understanding on these things, very important if you are to be a fisheries scientist, like this uh, polygamous or monogamous. Uh, uh, behavior like in the monogamous, something like in the uh, this Nemo, right? But their name is actually the clownfish. Uh, they have uh, monogamous behavior. They they have a territory where they protect. Uh, no outside uh, outsiders are allowed to come into their territory, right? So that's why they are monogamous. And other thing is. The in this uh, uh, here in this uh, uh, clown fish, there's only one large fish. Usually, it's a, a female, if I remember, female. Yeah, and the second large one is the male, and everyone else in that grade will be a smaller one. It's like you know, that's. A unique type of a, a reproductive strategy. That's why we call them as a monogamous because one time in a single time, there's only you know, one couple has chance to reproduce in that clade. Right? So the others won't have any chance. Right? So that's it called the monogamy. Right? And look at this one. It's a unique uh, type of again. Uh, a mating system, another type of monogamous uh, reproductive system in among fish, which is evident in this uh, 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 this uh, anglerfish again. Um, I don't know whether you can recognize uh, that they are this. They show the, the reproductive dimorphism. Dimorphism is the their male females are very different from uh, one another, and this big fish you can see is the is the female, right? Um, and the male is somewhere attached, like you said, the smaller one is the fem the male, 
uh, even this case is this one. Actually, these like uh, the male is parasitic on female, like they have some sort of a, a, a disc for them to attach to the female. Sometimes they have the whole life they stay attached to the female. Um, whereas in some cases, actually, when they are fully attached and even they connected one another by tissues even, right? So this kind of a so unique type of a reproductive strategy they have, all these are different adaptation that you would see in fish, right? Um, the, the other differences in the, the, the reproduction is the, the, the gender differences like uh, whether they the are male and females are, are different because the, the dimorphism sometimes, but sometimes male and female look very alike. And the some fish, they are called the gonochoristic, which means the, the male, female sexes are different. They are from the early stage, the, the male and females are fixed. But on the other hand, some fish, they are we call the hermaphrodites because they will have both male and female organs. Uh, even the hermaphrodites are the two types, the simultaneous versus sequential. The simultaneous is the, the, the both male and female there within their body. So they can produce both male, uh, eggs and sperm at the same time. So the simultaneous and the sequential uh, hermaphrodites, they can change from one sex to another during their lifetime. And so that's sequential, uh, especially in the lot of reef fishes, um, they have this kind of a, a hermaphrodite, you call sequential hermaphrodism. Right? So if you don't understand this, is just forget about that. Uh, you just need to understand there are so many uh, difference so the adaptations in their reproductive strategies right so um, as i mentioned before this most of these diverse type of reproductive behaviors are in among the the reef fishes because uh, it's a harsh environment with a lot of diverse groups so they have to survive uh, right so again the the one I described before, the, the, the differences in their sex, like in the clone fish, uh, the largest one is a female, the second largest one is a male, and the rest of the, the others in the group, they will be remain as a immature. They want to become mature until one of them die, right? You see, it's so uh, complicated as well as a, so diverse, right? Uh, uh, so we won't be able to cover these things in our lecture. So I'm just going to right. So <clears throat> the other differ, the other difference in the 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 reproductive strategies is the the parental care, whether the the adult have a parental care for their young ones, right? Whereas some fish have their parental care. And that case, they produce few eggs or the young ones, right? While the, the others, uh, most of the fish actually, they don't have parental care, which means they produce hundreds, thousands or millions of eggs at a time because the chances of survival is very low because there is no any parental care. The young ones, even egg for the, the uh, young ones, they have to survive themselves. So they have to produce millions of four thousands of eggs in that case, right? So uh, the other differences are, there are so many other like uh, the broadcast spawners, like uh, some fish, they spawn at the same time, like as a large group, they spawn at the same time. This is very common in the, especially in the coral reefs, right? In the coral reef, uh, uh, maybe after some clue, maybe like after a rain or after the moon, like uh, the full moon, the, 
all the the coral organism in that particular area they will uh, spawn at the same time and then that the whole reef will be filled with the the eggs and sperm and that's called the broadcast spawning uh, i have seen this in the i mean in the videos you will see this if you uh, search for the broadcast spawning in corals it's like a, a, so a more amazing thing i have i've seen this in the uh, Pigeon Island, actually, when we were visiting there, like there was some layer of uh, something unusual in the in the reef. Uh, we couldn't really figure out it before, and then we just put them to the microscope. Only we noticed that they are the 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 eggs and the sperm, especially the eggs of uh, corals. <clears throat> that's that's the boat's cut spawning. Um, Right, and uh, the, the fertilization, we know that some, as I mentioned in the very beginning, some of fish, they will have internal fertilization, whereas in the many cases, there will be external fertilization. Both male and female produce their, or they release their eggs into the open water where they fertilize externally. Right, uh, but of course there are some uh, differences in a uh, different organism. Right, um, right. As I mentioned before, some are uh, open spawners or the like, uh, just the the outside. Whereas the some are brooders where the the uh, take care of their young ones. Right. Um, that all depend on different fish. For example, here, uh, the open spawners were the brooders, like in the cardinal fish, you can see the, the mother keep all the young ones in their mouth until they're uh, strong enough to feed on their own, right? So every, all the, the young ones will be within their, inside their mouth. Uh, giving the protection for them, whereas a very unique feature in the 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 seahorses, like you might have heard about this one. This is one of the unique uh, type of fish because they the male have their pouch in their body, and the males are the one who take care of their youngs. Right? That's bit unusual in a animal world, but uh, that's how they uh, take care of their young ones, right? <clears throat> All right, so that's the um, little bit of a feeding behavior and uh, I have a small video again. Just have a look. The basic life cycle of most coral reef fish includes two major phases, demersal and planktonic. The more well known of these is the demersal phase, where the fish lives closely associated with the substrate on a coral reef or in a mangrove bed. Demersal means near to the bottom. This is a school of Caribbean rainbow parrotfish, Scarus guacamaya. The rainbow parrotfish has a complex life cycle that is accompanied by a series of colour changes called polychromatism. Like most other parrotfish species, they are sequential hermaphrodites, which means that they start their life as females and eventually change into males. The female initial phase seen here is usually a plain and dull coloration, while the male terminal phase is often vividly bright with intricate patterns. Most parrotfish species form harems where a single male presides over a group of females. Rainbow parrotfish are pelagic broadcast spawners, which means that they release their eggs and sperm together high into the water column, towards the surface and away from the reef, and this helps avoid the many predators that dwell there and would prey upon their newly fertilised eggs. Spawning often occurs during the late afternoon or early evening, 
on an outgoing tide so that eggs are quickly transported away from the reef and into the relative safety of the open ocean where there are fewer predators. Once out in the open ocean, the newly hatched juvenile parrotfish enter the planktonic phase of their life cycle. Larval parrotfish now become a part of the plankton, which includes a diverse group of organisms living in the surface of the water column, carried by ocean currents, and usually with limited swimming capability. Plankton is a crucial source of food for large marine animals and is composed of drifting animals, algae, and bacteria. Although many planktonic species are microscopic in size, there are organisms of a wide range of sizes overall. Here we see a larval parrotfish amongst the plankton. When she first hatches, the larva has a yolk sac which provides her with food for the first few days of her life. When her yolk sac is depleted, the larva begins to feed on other plankton that are smaller than herself, such as diatoms, dinoflagellates, and copepods. However, while she is small, the larva is very vulnerable to predation, and larval mortality in this phase is extremely high. The parrotfish larva must avoid everything that is bigger than her, which is a lot of organisms. This includes jellyfish, ketonaths, and larval crabs. The parrotfish larva has good vision and the ability to detect cues from predators, which helps her to survive. The planktonic larval phase of parrotfish and most other reef fish lasts between 30 and 90 days. During this time, they have little but some control over the direction of their movement. They can move between ocean currents that vary with depth, tides, and location. And as their larval phase draws to an end, they begin to search for suitable habitat on which to settle or recruit. The rainbow parrotfish, like many other reef fish, do not settle on the reef straight away. The reef is a very dangerous place for juvenile fish, full of many predators that would make an easy meal of them. Instead, parrotfish larvae settle first in a nursery habitat, and for this they use the mangrove forest. Here she undergoes a rapid transformation, taking on the familiar appearance of a small adult. In amongst the roots of the mangroves, she can find plenty of food and there are lots of hiding places where she can avoid potential predators, such as juvenile barracuda. Once she has grown larger, the juvenile parrotfish will begin to make her way out of the mangroves towards the coral reef. Along the way, she may utilize the cover of seagrass beds so that she is not exposed to predators. She's still very vulnerable, of course, because she's still quite small. Once she makes it to the reef, our small parrotfish will find a good hiding place. While small, she will spend much of her time taking refuge from the numerous predators that surround her, choosing her moments to carefully leave the shelter and graze on algal turfs. She may also join a group of other herbivores, forming a mixed species school that forage together and achieve the benefits of safety in numbers. This also allows them to overwhelm territorial damselfish that are defending their algal gardens. When fully grown, our now male adult parrotfish is much less vulnerable. He is able to graze on his own in relative safety and take time to defend his territory and preside over his own harem of females. He is still vulnerable to the biggest predators, however, and must always watch his back. Eventually, the time will come for the parrotfish to take his own harem and spawn, and from there, the life cycle begins again. As you can see, the life cycle of a parrotfish, like many other reef fish, is complex. It relies upon the connectivity of many different habitats and from open ocean to mangroves to the reef. Predator-prey interactions are an important influence throughout the life cycle of fish, affecting not only mortality but also growth and behaviour. Therefore, events that take place in the early life stages of fishes are critical to the fluctuations of fish populations in marine environments. Right, so that video take us to a, a one of the another very complex and an least known uh, area of fish that's called the, the larval dispersal, right? So the larval dispersal, as 
you have seen from that video actually I just downloaded uh, I downloaded just before the lecture um, from the YouTube I also seen for the first time um, so uh, this something called the the larval dispersal um, as you can see almost all fish have some sort of a uh, life stage what we call the planktonic life stage because they are so tiny they cannot swim against the currents and they have to move with the ocean currents uh, and that stage we call the uh, the planktonic larval stage so almost all marine species and even the freshwater i mean any, any aquatic species have this kind of a not all, but most of them have this planktonic larval stage, which drift with the currents. And this survival in the marine environment for them is going to be really, really harsh. Right? So, and for most of the species, actually, the larval stages where they are, how they are doing, or what they feed on, we don't know anything. For example, now we eat. Um, like a tuna, maybe Kelawala, Palaya or Talapat. But no one knows actually where their larval stages are. Where do they spawn? Where the larval stages are living? What kind of issues they are having? What are their feeding grounds? So actually we don't know much about that. But this Something called this larval dispersal is very important subject in fisheries management, especially uh, in the, the areas like in the, the coral reefs. Right? So this, the larval dispersal is the one that keep the, the connection between different reefs and different ecosystems and different areas. Right? So the larvae from one area will Will be migrate, uh, will disperse to another area, and some larvae from that area will be dispersed to this area. Likewise, that's how this the whole ocean is keeping uh, connected, um, and that's why it's very important the the concept of larval dispersal. Of course, this is again very complex subjects with very limited knowledge, but. Uh, uh, just you need to know again what it is and how it is important, uh, especially from the biological point of view, right? So, uh, so it's very important that we have some understanding of their uh, the larval dispersal or how they uh, uh, move from one place to another, right? And in this sense, uh, we have to know a little bit of a few terms. Of course, you know what is a larvae. The so larvae is a, a, a smaller version of the big fish, usually in a different in shapes from the adult. Uh, but usually they are independent. But uh, as mentioned, it's morphologically, they are different from the adults. And then a larvae won't be, I mean, you won't recognize the the adult may be very different from the larval stage. As you can see in the bottom picture, the, the adult barnacle uh, and their larvae is very different from one another. We won't notice it even. Right, so that's larvae. Then there's, there's a term called settlement. Right, so that's the, the uh, specific term that we use in the, the, the fisheries science or in the, even the fish biology. Uh, when the fish leave from one place to another and selecting or choosing a habitat for them to live and they completely change into a, a different form, right? So larvae change to a, um, a different form before becoming adult. Actually, this whole process we call the settlement, right? Uh, to me, settlement, take the some shape 
adult වෙනවා මොන මේ හැබැයි adult වගේ අඩුම ගන්නේ ඒ shape එකම adult shape එක අරගෙන වෙන කෙනෙක් එකකට පත් වෙන්න තමයි මේ settlement කියලා කියන්නේ. ඒකට ආ this is a very important uh, process what we call the settlement so the settlement may be in uh, in the open ocean sometimes as the it's shown in the video it can be in the mangrove maybe in the coral reefs likewise they will settle in a different area right so there's another term called the recruitment uh the recruitment also there's different meaning but uh, when the larvae uh, after dispersal like uh, the dispersal is the moving from the from the place where they born to the place where they settle and once they disperse settled and then change their body shape into a different form and when we can see in them in somewhere and that's we call the record like right for example if you if you go to eat somewhere in the reef they like some fish you can see, what you can see there they are actually recruited fish but they are larval stages or the smaller uh, size smaller ones might be uh, they could have been some else but now they have come to this reef where you can see them and that's called they now they have recruited to this habitat or this environment right so so that's a recruitment and um here are some of the examples of the larval stages and adults as you can see this triton the mollusk and their larvae how different from adult and the 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 larvae and this is a the christmas tree worm uh if you have ever in a, in a, ever had a chance to uh, snorkel in a reef you might feel you might see this kind of a christmas tree worms but very beautiful beautiful colored uh, animals there are so many different species uh, right uh, so they are the <coughs> the sea star uh, uh they are adult and the larvae right so very different right so <coughs> even the larval stages of fish they are different uh from one another and there are two type or two, two kind of a uh, larval stages actually one type called the lecithotrophic that, that means the these larvae they uh, survive on their yolk sac right uh, throughout their the larval stage they just survive from their yolk sac they don't have or they cannot feed but whereas the other larval stage they will i mean most of the cases fish they are actually pentatrophic which means um they have to feed and they have to get their nutrition their own uh, especially from plankton or the smaller ones right so they are called the pentatrophic larval stages and the others are the lecithotrophic or the the who has to survive on their yolk when they got where they got it from their the mother right so uh the here the the larval stages have different names actually different groups of marine organisms like in the crustaceans they are called the soia right the the amphiblastula and the veliga is the mollusk all the mollusk larvae like this one uh sorry this is a soya stage the mollusk larvae is the veliga larvae and the the coral larvae called the planula something like this uh is a planula larvae <clears throat> once again so none of these are for you to memorize right right uh, if it is a question the question will be something like uh, So what is a larval dispersal or how it is important or something like that that it will be a a uh, big question right not uh, something to get the in the very minute information right uh, 
Right, so again, as I mentioned before, this, uh, the, the almost all fish have this larval stages, which is planktonic, called the planktonic larval stage. And the larval adult stages may be living in some else. They will move to the open ocean or somewhere, or, or they will lay egg here, but they have to, the, the eggs will be uh, washed away to the open ocean where they become, they spawn, sorry, they fertilize and they, they produce their larvae. And they have to disperse or they will disperse, right? This is what we call the dispersal. They will move to a different place where this is the place we call the settlement, right? So they, the juveniles will settle here and become adult, right? So that is, you see the, the, the original or the, the mother or the parent uh, stock and the, the second generation will be living somewhere else. And that's where the two areas will be connected from this the process, what we call the larval dispersal, which is very important process in the marine environment. Um, this is very true about the, the coral reefs, right? Um, and this dispersal distances and the, the time frame may be very different. As you can see in these images, uh, some of the lobsters here, uh, they can disperse from the, the the US coast to even the, the, the European coast, like thousands of kilometers away from one another. But if you analyze them genetically, they were same, which means they have migrated or they were dispersed from one place to another, right? So, um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, the, the, the larval stages, the dispersal time may be from a couple of weeks to even several months, maybe more than one year, they have to just disperse or they have to uh, float with the ocean currents before finding a good place for them to settle. Right? So you can imagine it's how hard for them to, or how difficult or how unlikely for them to find a place for settlement, right? Now, um, right, so that is the, the, the larval dispersal. Uh, again, uh, the, there are the differences in the, uh, the, the larval <clears throat> dispersal types as well. Uh, as I mentioned before, there are phantotropic dispersal as well as lysitotropic uh, dispersal, but the, this may be different in the larvae. Um, and uh, so the what's going to happen to this uh, dispersal larvae? Uh, as you can see here in the in this diagram, like for example, if you take uh, some fish living in the shore, close to the shore, if they spawn and produce uh, some eggs and a sperm, and they fertilize here, what could happen to them? Right, some fish living here, they produce some eggs, and the male, male put the sperm and they fertilize and what could happen to them like they can flow with this the the long shore currents or the in currents running in across the 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 along the beaches and the some some of them will like um, they have to move with the the some of the nearby currents or some will taken away to the offshore Right, and waves and tides might take them back to the, the shore, something like that. There are so many things that can happen to them, right? So you see the, the survival of, of chances of surviving of these individual, uh, it's going to be extremely difficult as well as uh, uh, 
something very rare so that's where they have to produce thousands of millions of uh, eggs in this case right so the chances of survival is extremely low right so <clears throat> uh, so why this is important why this the dispersal and some knowledge of the dispersal is very important especially right so uh, this is very important especially if you are looking at like uh, the the management of uh, the the like if you have a, some sort of a protected area uh, like for the fisheries protected area or conservation areas you need to have a lot of a uh, uh, understanding on this uh, uh, the the larval dispersal behavior and uh, all the the other basic biological features, right? So here uh, there is one experimental results actually uh, in this uh, world map show. They have looking at some of the 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 marine reserves around the world and they have looked uh, or they have done some uh, research to see how effective this uh, protected area for the the for the fish marine fish in particular right you can see based on that result the the population densities has increased almost 90% i mean almost 100% increase in their densities the biomass increase nearly 200 so their biomass increase almost double like the size has increased over time and even the diversity has increased in a particular the protected area right so um, of course uh, a this is a little bit complicated thing but uh, uh, especially if you are like thinking of uh, managing uh, a fisheries in a particular country, you need to have some areas reserved for fish to survive, right? Now in Sri Lanka, actually we will discuss this towards the end uh, when talking about the fisheries management. And so the, the fish has very little chance to survive in the, in the marine environment. So at least we need to have some areas protected for the fish where they have some chances to Survive in that environment. Of course, the natural predation, natural things we can't control, but at least the fisheries. Like now, so far we talk about the natural things and naturally how the others predate on the fish. But on the top of that, the we as human beings, we are catching so many of them, even the larval stages, juvenile stages, or adult stage sometimes. So that putting a lot of pressure on that fish. So that's what actually I wanted to highlight here. It's the natural thing you can't control, of course, but uh, on, the, on top of that natural dangers that these small fish have, now you are putting a huge uh, pressure upon human being as well. Right? They are mostly targeting the large ones, but uh, also the juveniles as well as larval stages even sometimes. So that's going to give a huge impact to the fisheries. In long term, you see how this could impact because the, the survival chance will reduce maybe some 100 or 200 times less when we catch more fish in that environment, right? So that fishing going to cause huge issue for the, the survival, right? So we'll come back to these things uh, later on when, you, uh, when you're talking about the fisheries management. Uh, uh, like uh, we will talk about the marine reserves, protected areas or fisheries reserves, which is uh, going to be something very important for uh, the the protection or the the management of fisheries right uh, and the now we talk about the dispersal right uh, and there is another term that we use that is the migration right so the 
many cases uh, a lot of students get confused about these two things the dispersal versus migration right so the dispersal is usually a uh, one way right so then they are the the mother population they move away to a, some other area and then it's not a return journey right so they will settle in that particular environment and that's the end of that story so, so that's a dispersal but the migration is a uh, different uh, uh, that migration may be uh, for many different purposes right so uh, for example here in the 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 migration of salmon right so you might have heard about the salmon they like they reproduce in this kind of a, a freshwater body in a, usually in the the upstream but the larval stages they will they will move along the river towards the ocean and they will come back to the 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 the, the river system uh, maybe after so many years when they become mature and they will again reproduce and they will die right so this is a return journey so this uh, migration it's not a, a dispersal right so the keep in mind the the difference between the the dispersal and the migration we've all seen migrating birds but did you know fish migrate too we just don't usually see them moving. Out of sight, out of mind. But what if we could see what's happening in their underwater world? We'd see movement, lots of movement. Fish need to move because they always have somewhere to go. They move to find habitat, food, places to spawn, or escape extreme temperatures as well as high and low water flows. Some fish travel really long distances migrating thousands of miles up and down rivers and across the ocean. But what happens when fish encounter obstacles? There are over six million known man-made barriers in the United States, and they've played a huge role in the decline and disappearance of many migratory fishes. You may think, so what? Why should I care about some fish? For starters, fish tell us about the health of our waters. What's good for migrating fish is also good for other wildlife and people. They're a key link in the food chain and they're delicious. They're an important part of our history and our future too. Besides, migrating fish are just plain cool. How can you help migratory fish? Consider all the ways we can affect fish movement. Inspire others to care and conserve fish and their habitats and the connections between those habitats. And you can even become a fish watcher. You just never know what you might see. We do talk about the, the importance of uh, the migration, but uh, this is not really for the marine fish in particular. Uh, this video actually talk about the like a fresh water, like a, uh, dams, um, the construction, how would affect the migration. Um, the same thing, of course, affect the Sri Lanka as well, but uh, uh, that's not uh, for marine fish. Anyway, um, <clears throat> the migration, as I mentioned, it is usually a, a, a return journey, but that also can be like a migration for several meters, several kilometers to hundreds or thousands of kilometers sometimes. Uh, so that migration may be very different, uh, like different forms of migration, for example, nocturnal migration. The, uh, so they will uh, come to the, the or they move uh, within a day, right? Uh, they start moving with sunset, right? And, and 
especially they come to the surface with sunset and they will move to the bottom again uh, with the sunrise right so that's nocturnal migration so that that migration takes place during night right whereas the others we call twilight migration where they uh, like uh, in the evening hours or early hours they will do the migration uh, whereas they will retain in the other and uh, their normal habitat at the other time right the other one is the reversed uh, the migration that's they will ascend to the or they descend actually during the daytime and uh, they will come to the surface at the evening right likewise uh, so there are different form of uh, a migration that's some are actually um, uh, related to the their attraction to the 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 light right some uh, some prefer light they come to the surface with sunlight but some um, resistant to the light especially like a planktons they cannot withstand um, high or uh, highly illuminated light so they will avoid that kind of thing right so so that is a dial vertical migration but the the other migration is actually the long distance migration like what we discussed in the the eels in that previous video so i will talk about the like the, the long distance migration um, this eels have actually unique type of a, a migration behavior they're long and slithery and they're not very colorful but they do have a strange beauty of their own their sinuous nocturnal movements through the water are mesmerizing to watch and though they may resemble underwater snakes eels are in fact a very interesting type of fish there are several things about eels that make them unique besides their elongated shape and limbless bodies for one thing eels have the ability to breathe through their skin some can even leave the water and move over land for short periods and unlike most migratory fish such as salmon which spawn in fresh water but live their adult lives in salt water eels of the genus anguilla migrate in the opposite direction spawning and breeding in oceans and seas while spending most of their intervening time in fresh water if we were to take one such freshwater eel and follow its life story it would be born in the middle of the north atlantic ocean about 1000 miles east of bermuda this area called the sargasso sea forms the western part of a subtropical gyre a giant whirlpool in the middle of the ocean our eel let's call it eli would begin as one of 10 to 20 million tiny eggs carried by a female eel hatching into a transparent leaf-shaped thing that looks nothing like an adult eel eli starts to drift in ocean currents predominantly the gulf stream towards either europe or north america depending on its particular species upon reaching the coast Eli is about 2 inches long, looking more eely but still transparent, known at this stage as a glass eel. But within a couple of days in freshwater, Eli's skin becomes pigmented a brownish black, now looking more like that of an adult eel. You might notice that we haven't mentioned anything about Eli's gender yet. That's because this is only determined once an eel enters freshwater, though nobody is sure exactly how that happens. Most of the eels that stay in the estuaries and brackish water become males, while those that go upstream become females, growing up to 2 to 3 times bigger than their future mates. In this case, it turns out that Eli was actually short for Elaine. As a female eel, Elaine will be quite solitary for most of her life in the stream, eating whatever falls in the water, grasshoppers, crickets, small fish, insect larvae, frogs, baby birds. almost anything she can get her mouth around and she will grow quite big up to 4 feet long and weighing as much as 13 pounds we don't know exactly how freshwater eels know when it's time to return to the ocean but something calls to them and their fall migration is one of the largest unseen migrations on the planet as a lane leaves freshwater for the ocean she undergoes a shocking metamorphosis her eyes enlarge by about 10 times her skin gets thicker and her fins get larger 
These are most likely adaptations for their upcoming ocean travel, and Elaine seamlessly makes the transition from fresh to salt water, which would be toxic for most other fish. Once Elaine leaves the mouth of the freshwater streams, she will disappear completely from human view. No one has witnessed or been able to follow an adult eel on their migration, nor do we know how deep they spawn. But it's assumed that they can follow some signs that they can detect, such as a thermal barrier between ocean currents or a salinity front, in order to return to the same area of the ocean where they were born. Because we don't even know exactly what happens during an eel's migration, we can only imagine what the actual breeding looks like. But the common hypothesis is that Elaine and thousands or hundreds of thousands of other eels gather in large intertwined masses and release their eggs and sperm in a giant orgy known as panmixia. A couple of days after the eggs are laid, they hatch and the cycle begins again. And because we've never seen the adult eels returning up the freshwater rivers, we must assume that, having completed their long and roundabout journey, these amazing and mysterious creatures finally die there in the same place where they were born. Goodbye, Elaine. It was a pleasure knowing you. Right. That was a very interesting uh, story, actually. Uh, that video is created based on one of the, the long-term study on the eels migration. It's very interesting something. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, the migration actually, as I mentioned before, maybe for many different reasons, we, we, at least we can recognize different migration uh, types, for example, called the elementary migration that is just searching for food. They migrate just for finding food. Uh, the, the other one is the, the gametic migration, that's for the, the reproduction. They, just like a salmon, they migrate upstream for their reproduction. They, with the others are the climatic migration. Uh, so looking for better condition or the climatic condition or rather the oceanographic condition. The other migration for the osmoregulatory migration, that is the, when they cannot uh, withstand the salinity or less salinity or high salinity, that's where they have to migrate. Likewise, they, there are many reasons why they're migrating, but for some fish, we actually don't know why do they migrate, but anyway, they do migrate for some reason. And basically, um, there are different forms of migration, right? Uh, so that a migration, especially the, the spawning migration, we can, categorize or you can divide into different forms like a, a called the diadromous migration, the protamidromous migration and oceanodromous migration, right? The, the oceanodromous, as you can understand, it's the, within the ocean, they migrate within the ocean, right? The, the, the protamidromous is within fresh water, for migrate from one freshwater system or another freshwater system. And the, the others are the diadromous fish. They are the, they can be anadromous or catadromous. The anadromous are the from sea to freshwater. The catadromous are the from freshwater to seawater, right? So these are the, the basic uh, form of uh, migration uh, that you would see in different fish. Uh, uh, why this is important, of course, uh, you know, just to uh, understand the science behind this migration, but other than that, for the fisheries, it's also very important, you know, the fishermen also target uh, fish in their migratory paths. Like some, some fishermen set up their nets in the river mouth in the afternoon hours, where the prawns, have their migration from the sea to the estuary or the lagoon. So they target that time, they put set their net and for catching from, right? So the migrational behavior is not just for the, the biological inter, um, 
uh, interest, but also that's all very important for the fisheries as well, right? So now it's very clear that uh, for the fishermen, we need to have a, a lot of scientific understanding on the fish different behavior, their biological uh, adaptation and biological behaviors. Um, or perhaps fisher might not know anything about these things, but at least from the experience, they know that these things, uh, no matter whether they know or not, but they do follow their behavior in many cases, right? All right, so that's the end of today's uh, session on the further on the biological aspects, especially the reproduction, the dispersal and migration. The dispersal and migration, these terms, they are very important uh, aspects in the fisheries, especially if you are a fisheries scientist. These are one of the key things to look at uh, if you're thinking of a uh, fisheries management uh, 